Coffee. Without it, we would never have had the Industrial Revolution. We'd all be still living in Europe in mud huts. Here in Laredo, we have the Organic Man Coffee Trike. 4501 McPherson, the best coffee on the planet. If you can't get to Laredo, you can order from the Organic Man Coffee Trike dot shop. <clears throat> And welcome to the show. I'm your host, Chris James. Tonight's show was suggested by Bill Lahr. It's called, What's for Dinner? I can speak English and some Spanish. There are a few words and names in the show that I'm not even going to try to pronounce correctly. If you know how to say these words, fine. I'll just pronounce them the way they look. You can send me an email saying this is how that word is pronounced, but uh, it's not going to do me any good because, like I said, I have a hard enough time with English and Spanish, so just bear with me. Uh, folks have been known to eat some strange things. In some countries, what is considered good eats in others is considered nasty. I kind of like spam. The food, not the junk mail you get in your inbox. We call it mystery meat. Some say there's no telling what's in a can of Spam. Well, you have pork with ham, salt, water, modified potato starch, sugar, and sodium nitrite. Ham is from a pig's back legs, while pork is any meat from a pig. Ham has a kind of a salty, sweet, smoky flavor depending on the preservation process, and, well, pork doesn't have the same flavor. This means that ham is pork, but pork is not always ham. In Hawaii, Spam is not seen in a bad light at all. Although it's cheap and some consider it low quality, a Spam is still eaten by people both rich and poor, old and young. A spam is a part of Hawaii's culinary tradition, and it appeal, its appeal has no boundaries in the Hawaii. A friend of mine, Henry Chang, said you can find spam lunch stands all over the island, kind of like taco stands in Laredo. Next time you're having a spam sandwich, just say you're eating a Hawaiian meal. Residents of Alaska and Canada's northernmost regions eat moose. A lot of folks hunt moose as a food source, and they, like most hunters, believe you use most of what you kill. Moose meat is eaten in the form of steaks or sausages or even on a pizza. One moose dish, however, remains a rare delicacy. A jellied moose nose. Indigenous hunters in the greater northwest could rely on one whole moose to feed an entire family for weeks. Every part of the animal was eaten or preserved, including the nose. A moose's nose is long and bulbous and is considered a delicacy among indigenous communities. A jellied moose nose is similar to European's head cheese. A trapping cuts of moose nose within a gelatinous broth. The dish was even mentioned in Northern Cookbook, a 1967 publication by the Canadian government that offered recipes and cooking advice for wilderness wives living in the backwoods of the far north. A moose's nose contains both white and dark meat. The fur is removed prior to cooking. 
either by singeing it off over an open fire, peeling it off, or simply skinning the nose. I've skinned my nose once or twice when I had bike accidents, but, well, that's a different story. A chefs then slice the nose and simmer it with onions, garlic, and array of spices, which may include cinnamon, cloves, allspice, or mustard seed. Meat from other parts of the moose's head, like the lips and the ears, may be added to the mix. Once the concoction has cooled down, the cook lays the pieces of meat in a loaf pan, douses them with broth, and places the mixture in the refrigerator so the broth can solidify. The resulting jelly is served like a loaf of bread and eaten in slices. Mm. I've had moose a few times. Years ago, my dad knew a guy who hunted a lot, and one year he bagged a moose, and we got a few nice cuts. To me, it tasted pretty much like steak, only a bit chewier. <coughs> At one of my first jobs, I did a bit of work for a railroad. The guy in charge traveled all over the United States and Canada. He told us Moose would walk out onto the tracks and a train was coming along. The engineer would blow the horn, but the Moose, instead of getting off the tracks, would put his head down and charge the oncoming train. Well, the Moose was no match for a train. The conductor would make a note of where the Moose was hit. This was passed on to the crew that repaired the tracks in the area. The crew would hustle out to the scene of the collision and grab as much of the remains as there was. Might have to chase off the wolves and the coyotes, but hey, it was a fresh kill. <clears throat> they would cut up the body, removing bones and all the inedible parts, and place half of what they had in a mailbag. This could be from 150 to 200 pounds of meat. As the train came back by, uh, they would catch the bag and the train crew would each get a hunk of meat. They did this so often that many of them would give the meat away instead of eating it. You know, you can only pack so much into a freezer. What was that about head cheese? Head cheese, or brawn, is a cold-cut terran of meat jelly often made with flesh from the head of a calf or a pig that originated in Europe. Usually eaten cold or at room temperature, the dish is, despite the name, not dairy cheese. The parts of the head used in the dish vary, though commonly do not include the brain, eyes, ears of the animal. The tongue and sometimes the feet and heart of the animal may be included. The dish is also made using the trimmings from more commonly eaten cuts of pork and veal, with the addition of gelatin to the stock in order to act as a binding agent. This is something I will happily avoid ever consuming. Uh, during my time in the Army, I ate a few things that were really bad. MREs, also known as meals rejected by Ethiopians. The first MREs were not that good. A dehydrated meat in a bag. You soaked it in water for an hour, but it still tasted like a sponge. They had hot dogs. Well, it was just the wieners. They tasted like mushy meat. No buns, just hard crackers. The peanut butter looked like brown toothpaste. It was okay, but it was really runny, and on a hot day it would run off the edges of your cracker, and you'd get it all over inside your mustache and down the front of your uniform. That was the nice thing about Woodland Camel. You really couldn't tell if those were stains or just part of the pattern. When you're hungry, you might eat just about anything. Some folks eat nasty things even when they have a choice of good food. 
Hakarl, or fermented shark, is a phenomenon that has gone way beyond the confines of austere Icelandic winter. In terms of flavor, it tends to be described with all of the very worst words you can come up with. Yet the usual dish continues to sell with many tourists challenging themselves and each other to try some of this rotten shark. <clears throat> Whether it's feet, a stale cheese, urine, gym clothes, rotten eggs, or a combination of all of the above, a carl is a singular experience that most people describe as the worst thing ever to pass their lips. It is number one, or close to it, on every list of the world's most disgusting foods, yet people want to eat it or see other people try. If you go to YouTube and search, you'll find hundreds of videos of people trying to eat Hakarl. Some of them actually get it into their mouths. Usually it's the same outcome. They wind up throwing up a lot. Gordon Ramsay and Anthony Bourdain were both victims of the rotten shark. <laughs> they had uh, about the same thing to say for it. It was far worse than they were expecting. I don't think either one of them was able to hold it down. Uh, fishermen catch a Greenland shark, and the flesh of which is poisonous. Uh, they cut off the shark's head, and they bury the body in sandy soil, and then they cover it with rocks. Uh, this is to squeeze the poison out. Uh, the body stays in the ground for 6 to 12 weeks. The rotting shark is then dug up and hung in sheds to dry. Uh, this part of the process takes a few more months. Uh, those willing to eat this rotten meat are welcome to whatever nasty things happen to them. I will pass. Uh, someone else can have all my share of rotten shark. Uh, Sir Stroming is an infamous Swedish delicacy made of fermented Baltic sea herring. In spring, the spawning fish are caught between Sweden and Finland, and then the heads are removed and the bodies are stored in a series of saltwater solutions. After roughly two months, the partially preserved herring are transferred to airtight tins, that's a can here in the United States, and they continue to ferment for up to a year. Each year's batch of Baltic herring cannot be sold before the third Thursday in August by royal decree. <laughs> the mid-20th century ordinance was meant to tackle fermentation corner cutting. While this rule is not actually on the books anymore, the date is still celebrated as the delicacy's premier day, particularly in Sweden's high coast region, the birthplace of Sir Stroming. In 1981, a German landlord evicted a tenant without notice after the tenant spread Sir Stroming brine in the apartment building's stairwell. When taken to court, the court ruled in favor of the termination after the landlord's lawyer simply opened a can in the courtroom. The court stated that it had convinced itself that the disgusting smell of the fish brine far exceeded the degree that fellow tenants in the building could be expected to tolerate. Sir Stroming's defining quality and source of international notoriety is its distinctive smell. A 2002 Japanese study found that the smell of Sir Stroming is one of the most putrid in the world. It was ranked stronger than the Korean Hongyo Ho, <laughs> fermented skatefish. 
a Japanese natto, the soybeans fermented with intestinal bacteria, and the most pungent of canned cheeses. A durian fruit wasn't even mentioned in this study. Hongi Ho, well, that's how it's spelled, H-O-N-G-E-O dash O-H-O-E, is fermented skate, which is well known as the hardest thing to swallow in Korea. Harder than their government mandates. Its smell is similar to the smell of a public toilet. If you are one of those folks that is willing to try eating anything while in a foreign country, then you deserve what happens to you. It's one thing to get food poisoning by accident. It's all your fault if you know you're ingesting rotten food. A skate is put in a refrigerator for about a month to ferment. It is well known to have a ammonia smell. Now, this is because the skate don't have bathroom facilities like other fish. Well, they're not facilities, they're faculties. They don't have kidneys or bladders. The skate just pump the waste products out through their skin. So the skin is permeated with nasty stuff. Uh, combining this with allowing the fish to rot gives it an all new level of funk. Many Koreans say they're addicted to this bizarre delight. A fermented fish are often annoying, but Hong Ho is a Korean specialty. This dish is considered to be one of the most terrifying dishes in the world, even for the bravest eaters. I say nay nay. If the smell makes you gag before the thing passes your lips, you're doing it wrong. Uh, the stink head is a dish made from salmon. A salmon is a staple of the native Alaskan diet, and the natives have a traditionally used all parts of the fish. One of the traditional delicacies is fermented salmon heads. Colloquially, yeah, colloquially, nah, the dish has earned the name a stink head fish. I'm going to have to practice that word, colloquially, col yeah, C-O-L-L-O-Q-U-I-A-L-L-Y. <laughs> oh, well, I can't roll my R's and I can't pronounce colloquially, that word. That, for some odd reason, there are just some words that some people can't pronounce, and, well, that's mine. I have lots of them. Do you remember that song, Fish Heads? It was a novelty song by comedian rock duo Barnes and & Barnes, and it was released as a single in 1978. It later featured on their 1980 album Vubamha. It was the most requested song on the Dr. Demento radio show, and a music video for the song was made in 1980, and it was a regular rotation on MTV. The song was written and performed by none other than Billy Moomy from Lost in Space fame. Remember Danger Will Robinson? Well, that was Billy Moomy. He and his friend Robert Hamer came up with this weird song after having what was described as experiencing the infamous meal. I wonder if they tried eating a stinkhead soup. I'll bet when they put this song together, they never expected it to become so popular. The heads of king salmon are buried in the ground in fermentation pits. And then they're put into plastic or wooden barrels, even sometimes plastic food storage bags, and left to allow nature to do its thing for a few weeks or more. The heads are then harvested and consumed as a putty-like mush. A fermentation was sometimes used as a preservation technique. Before refrigeration, canning, and other modern preservation techniques became available, a fermentation was an important preservation method. 
Fish rapidly spoil, and unless some method is applied to stop the bacteria that produces the spoilage, a fermentation is a method which attacks the ability of microbes to spoil the fish. To me, that's redundant. You spoil the fish to prevent spoiling. Fermented fish preparation can be quite a memorable thing since the fermented fish stink to high heaven. With modern ways to preserve fish, the only possible reason people still ferment fish is they just like the taste and the smell. The eggs from the salmon are also stored by fermentation. This is known as stink eggs. I've run across some spoiled food on a few occasions. <clears throat> when my wife and I were fixing up our home, it had sat empty for two years. There was a refrigerator in the kitchen. I knew it was going to be bad, but I opened the door anyway. The fridge had been left full of food. Meat, eggs, you name it. The smell got into my nose and it stayed there for several days. I drugged the whole thing out to the driveway and I duct taped the door shut, figuring the city would come by and haul it off. <laughs> well, somebody came by late that night and they took the refrigerator home with them. I wonder how surprised they were once they opened that door. It was, it was really, really bad. A fugu fish may just be Japan's most notorious food. In the country's capital, fugu, also known as Japan, Japanese puffer fish, blowfish or globefish, is a seasonal delicacy. Highly sought after in winter when fugu are at their plumpest. Uh, Tokyo's Fugu restaurants proud, proudly display the latest bulbous catch in a highly visible tank, later to be served up as Fugu sushi sashimi or in a hot pot. <laughs> puffer fish are highly poisonous. The toxin in the puffer fish, called tetrodotoxin, is found throughout its body, and it's produced by bacteria. A tetrodotoxin causes paralysis and death, and the victims of tetrodotoxin poisoning often remain conscious until the last seconds. The paralysis prevents them from reacting to stimuli, much like Clervius Narcisse described after his own death. If you don't recognize the name, Clervius Narcisse was turned into a zombie May 2nd, 1962. You can get the whole story by looking up zombies in Haiti. So what's so good about fugu? To me, it's just fish. Uh, folks are willing to pay a lot of money to eat the puffer fish. Why? Maybe it's because this is one life-risking meal. This is the equivalent to skydiving or Russian roulette, only in food. The liver, ovaries, and skin, among other parts of the Japanese puffer fish, can contain lethal amounts of tetrodotoxin. A fugu poison is several hundred times more toxic than cyanide, with just a sliver of the poisonous parts enough to cause death. While the dish is served minus the potentially deadly organs, much care must be taken to ensure that these parts are sufficiently removed and that they do not contaminate the meat. If you cut through the organs with a knife that then passes through the meat, well, guess what? You've got fugu poisoning in the meat. And nationwide, there are about 20 to 40 cases of fugu poisoning a year, with several of these folks finding out if there is an afterlife. Would this be considered suicide, since the person eating the fish knows what might happen? There are over a hundred different varieties of puffer fish, each with varying degrees of lethality and poisonous parts. A fugu chef has to be knowledgeable about all of these varieties. Just one tiny slip of the knife 
or one momentary lax could lead to death. A death by fugu poisoning is particularly unpleasant. The symptoms include dizziness, weakness, headaches, nausea, and difficulty breathing. The victim remains fully conscious while the body shuts down from the inside, the toxin paralyzing the muscles to the point that they can no longer move, speak, or respond, and they can't breathe. There's no known antidote. You know you need to breathe. You try to tell your lungs to get going, but the signal never gets to where it needs to be. As you lay there dying, you would have no one to blame but yourself. <laughs> Treatment is pretty simple. You support the victim's respiratory and circulatory system while the toxin is excreted from the body. In some regions of Japan, it is usual practice to wait three days before proceeding with funeral arrangements, as in some cases the victim's paralysis has masked any signs of life, and they have woken right before their cremation was about to start. <laughs> I can really enjoy a pizza, especially now that I make my own. I make the dough. You have to start several hours before you're going to make the rest of the pizza. I chop the onions and the sausage. I make my own pizza sauce. The last time I had a ready-made pizza, well, it wasn't that good. I tried eating it and I kept thinking to myself, man, I wish I'd made my own. Since I retired, I've been learning to cook and this is making most ready-made meals not all that attractive. Fast, yes. Good, no. Why do some people insist on eating something that is expensive and might kill them? Uh, probably the idea that they will impress others with their extravagant lifestyle. I'm really impressed by fe folks that waste money. My pickup is 16 years old. I'm having it painted since the sun here has baked off all of the old paint. I didn't get it painted to impress anybody. I just didn't like the way it looked. Me and my wife discussed it, and after several go-arounds, we finally said, what the heck, it's cheaper than buying new vehicles. And so we took them both to a paint shop. Well, we took hers to a paint shop, had it painted. Once we got it back, I dropped mine off, and, well, they're working on it now. It's going to look exactly the same color as when I bought it, but at least now it'll have some paint. A fugu hasn't always been a fine dining dish. In fact, most of the deaths have historically come from fishermen and their families. After catching the fish and trying to prepare it themselves, usually because there was a food shortage. Now these days, similar incidents still happen, but mostly because people see it as a chance to try it at home without having to pay that high price ticket at a restaurant. It should come as no surprise that because of the threat to human health and safety, each prefecture, I guess that's kind of like a state here in the U.S., has an ordinance on handling of fugu and fugu preparation. The two-year training ordinance was enacted by the Tokyo Metropolitan Government in 1949 in response to numerous fugu poisoning deaths during post-World War II food shortages, mostly as a result of people catching their own Japanese puffer fish and cooking them without the necessary knowledge to do so safely. The move was supported by the fugu restaurant industry, who wanted fugu to be seen as a safe food. The tight regulations helped to protect the industry in many ways and allowed fugu to keep its prized elusiveness and high price. They didn't do it because they wanted safety. They did it because they wanted people to pay a lot of money to eat this poisonous food. What you put in your body becomes your body. Uh, those who choose to eat at restaurants that have a clown as their spokesman will begin to look like a clown. 
It's not all that hard to eat right, as long as you do a little research and learn how to cook. The convenience of fast food combined with the public image has led to a lot of bad diet decisions. Eating poisonous fish and seeing what your body becomes, well, it's your choice. Make wise decisions. I'm going to take a brief pause here and put in a couple of commercials for my sponsors. Don't go away. We'll be right back after this. Nature has a way of messing with people. There are some foods that grow naturally and look mostly edible. Way back in 1987, we were shipped to Gowan Field, Idaho for winter training. We got there and just to mess with the locals, we ran a Texas flag up the flagpole. It received an immediate outcry. A couple of the guys from the base wandered into our mess hall one day. They were just sticking their noses in where they didn't belong, and we knew it, and so did they. <laughs> At the end of the serving line sat a huge can of jalapeno peppers. One of these guys looked at it and asked, what the heck is a jalapeno? One of our guys said it was a form of Texas candy, and they tasted really good. The Ohio guy was about to grab one, but he was told, Oh, no, no, get that great big one. The bigger they are, the better they taste. He did, and he took a great big old bite. As steam was coming out of his ears and eyes, somebody told him that hot coffee would take the sting away. We never saw those guys again. I wonder who was the first person to eat a jalapeno. Probably the same guy that invented induced vomiting. Durian fruit is generally slightly oval, about a foot wide, and covered in formidable looking spikes. The fruit can weigh between 2 to 7 pounds, and this is heavy enough that if you hold it in your hand, it will sink into your skin. It could possibly pierce the skin and cause you to bleed. You're supposed to hold it by the stem. Its otherworldly appearance is dwarfed by another one of its attributes, the smell. Durians have a strong, rank smell that permeates the outer shell and lingers long after the fruit has been removed. Some say it smells like dirty socks or used diapers. A few even said it smelled like a dead body. The inner part looks like runny hot cheese. Some people refer to it as durian cheese instead of fruit. Despite the stench, durian is extremely healthy, even more so than many other fruits. It's naturally rich in iron, vitamin C, and potassium. It improves muscle strength and skin health and even lowers blood pressure. I think that was all said by the people trying to sell the fruit. Uh, furthermore, one small durian contains 23 grams of dietary fiber, which is nearly all your daily nutritional requirements. It's important to not eat durian in excess. 2010, Malaysian politician Ahmad Lai Bujang was rushed to the hospital complaining of breathlessness and dizziness after gorging himself on durian. Anthony Bourdain, who said he actually enjoyed eating the stinky fruit, described the aftermath of eating it. He said, Your breath smells like you've been French kissing your dead grandmother. Now there's a, there's a really nasty sight to see. A durian is a strange combination of savory, sweet, creamy all at once. A durian is supposed to have subtile hints of chives mixed with powdered sugar. It's supposed to taste like diced garlic and caramel poured into a whipped cream base. If you can get past the smell. If you have to hold your nose to get the fruit into your mouth, it's probably going to be a bad idea. 
You can always get vitamin C and iron and fiber and potassium from other sources. So why put up with the smell? It will also encourage you to brush your teeth a lot after each meal. Akasu marzu comes from the Italian island of Sardinia, located in the Mediterranean Sea. The cheese is made from sheep's milk. Akasu marzu takes some time to make, but then just about every good kind of cheese does. The process of making the cheese is very easy. First, the sheep's milk is heated. Then it's given about three weeks to set so that it can curdle. Once it has set long enough that a crust is formed, you cut open the top of the crust and you leave the cheese sitting out in the open. This makes it an inviting target for flies to come and... Uh, do what flies do. They eat and they lay eggs. Next, the cheese is left in a dark hut for two or three months. During that time, the fly eggs hatch in the larva and promptly begin to eat the now rotting cheese. Anything that eats must get rid of the waste. The little bugs go to the bathroom all throughout the cheese. The excretions that pass through their bodies are essential as they are what gives the cheese its distinct soft texture and rich flavor. Mm. Once the maggots have eaten and then excreted the cheese, it's time to enjoy. Not. As some say the cheese tastes like a very rich but ripe gargonzola cheese. What you're not thinking of is you're not really eating cheese, you're eating maggot poop. No one has made a song about baby flies yet. I'll bet a song will come out soon. All the school kids will be singing it, and some toy company will come out with an action figure. If you don't know what a baby fly is, well, look it up. It's a maggot. <laughs> If you now have an overpowering urge to try maggot cheese, well, you're out of luck. It is illegal. The only way to buy Kasu Marzu is over the Italian black market. If you do get your hands on some worm cheese, uh, take a look at the inhabitants. They should still be wiggling. If all the baby flies are dead, you have some bad Kasu Marzu, if such a thing can exist. As if wormy cheese could go bad. Really, if your cheese is filled with maggots, it's already bad. If your cheese is wiggling or moving, there is something wrong with it and probably you for buying it in the first place. If for some unknown reason you still want to eat wiggly cheese, but sure to close your eyes and you don't want to watch it as it comes towards your mouth. The reason for this is, the maggots sometimes will jump. You don't want to get a maggot in your eyeball. That's just nasty. You're supposed to chew the cheese really well, so you don't swallow any live worms. As some folks will tell you the maggots will drill holes through your stomach. I would think the stomach acid would prevent this, but then there is a thing called... Myosis, which is caused by maggots tunneling through the old bread basket. The maggots that cause meiosis can live in the stomach and intestines as well as the mouth. This can cause serious tissue damage and require medical attention. Probably a psychologist, too. Trying to figure out why did you eat maggoty cheese? I go to some great extremes and expenses to avoid having flies and their offspring in my food. I'm not about to eat food on purpose that is infested with wiggly creatures. Now, if you still have an overpowering urge to eat kasu marzu, maybe you should seek medical help, as in a psychiatrist or psychologist. It's just a thought. I'm not saying you're crazy. I'm only implying it. 
There are plenty of fish in the sea, but when the sea isn't in reach, there are plenty of ants in the sand. They too lay eggs, and like fish eggs, they have caviar. They call it the caviar of the desert, and it's very expensive. Ant pupae and larva, called escamole, is considered an opulent treat in Mexico. The name derives from the word ascamole, a Nahutal word for ant and stew. This landlocked delicacy, which resembles pine nuts or corn kernels, has a nutty, buttery taste, and it's kind of like cottage cheese when you put it in your mouth. Due to their delicate, palatable flavor, escamoles are often prepared simply by frying them in butter with onions and chili and then wrapping them in a corn tortilla and served as a taco. Ant tacos. This prized egg is produced by the Liamotopum apicultum, or the velvety tree ant. The odor of their nests has earned the insect another name. Locals refer to them as Ormigas pedora, <laughs> the, f the farting ants. I can just picture a bunch of people walking around sniffing the air trying to catch an aroma of gas. Gas as in effluence, the, the brown cloud, if you will. Escamoles are collected from the high plains of central Mexico, where the velvety tree ant tunnels its home among the roots of mezcal and tequila plants. The difficulty involved in acquiring escamoles only adds to their prized reputation. Uh, furthermore, collection season is very short. A nest produces eggs about four times exclusively between February and April. Now, I wonder why are they called velvety tree ants if they live in mescal and tequila plants, and in the roots, no less. With proper care, farmers can return to a single nest up to 20 years, though knowledge of proper collection techniques is thought to be too limited, giving demand. Escamoleros, the people who track down these tiny eggs in the wild, can sustainably harvest up to 70% of the eggs in each nest. But the incentive to collect a greater quantity is very strong. One kilogram of escamoles can cost 35 to to $100, while many escamoleros carefully scrape away the tops of the nests and use sieves to separate the ants from their larvae. Others aren't all that careful. They want the money, not the uh, sustainable income. Escamole is a trendy item on upscale tasting menus in Mexico City, but the fervor predates the Hispanic era. Before the Spanish landed in present-day Mexico, indigenous people ate escamoles as a source of protein. Aztec emperors dined on the same des desert caviar about 800 years ago. There are ancient tales of feasts with escamoles on the menu to prove it. The only eggs I want to eat come from chickens. A foul food indeed. I call it chicken caviar or just plain eggs. Biwendegi silkworm pupae is a popular snack sold by street vendors in Korea. In the United States, one is limited to canned biondigi sold in Korean grocery stores or over the internet if you want. The canning process imparts a metallic flavor and an undesirable insipid texture. It's bugs in a can. These bugs are supposed to be crunchy and taste like, well, bugs, I guess. Not supposed to taste like the can they come out of. If you want to try some, you can order them over the internet. They say once you get your canned bugs, you need to drain the liquid and then rinse the little darlings with a lot of water. You let them dry for a few hours, marinate your bugs in soy sauce or sriracha hot sauce, bake for 45 to 60 minutes or until crisp, and then enjoy.
As you open the can, the smell rushing out is most unpleasant. Now try to keep your lunch on the inside so you don't lose your drive to eat bugs. <laughs> Vamos a matar las chinchas en otro lugar. Now, this is my favorite saying in Spanish. Uh, probably the most Spanish I can say at one time. I say it in public many times. The folks that understand will laugh, but those that don't think I'm saying something intelligent and impressive. They look at me like I'm saying something they need to remember. Once they find out what it means, it's something they wish they could forget. It means let's go kill stink bugs someplace else. Who came up with this is beyond me. I'm only repeating what I learned. Any time I say this, my wife gives me that look. The Mexican comestible bugs, also known as edibles, are the humil, the chincha de monte, and the zoxlili. <laughs> I think that's how it's pronounced. Zoxlili? They are eaten especially in the streets of Morales and Guerrero. The consumers say they have a specific cinnamony flavor uh, coming from the stems and the leaves that they feed on. Others say they have a bitter medicine-y flavor, probably due to their high iodine content. They're also rich in vitamin B2 and 3. Humilis are used for making a specific sauce and as taco filling. As taco filling in Taxco and other regions of Mexico there are eaten alive as humilis, humilis can live up to one week after cooking including including having their heads cut off that's my phone telling me I got a text a scientific research has shown that humil has analgesic and tranquilizing qualities Humil was described by the Mexican high cuisine of following the European standards as it was seen as having a typical stinky scent and spicy bug flavor of other stink bugs. If you've never stepped on a stink bug, well, go out and find one of those little five-sided creatures and smash him. See what it smells like and you'll say, man, I don't want to eat that. Their consumption as food was regarded as the result of food shortages as well as superstitions. And since the pre-Hispanic epoch, they have been collected for the festival of the deceased. The Aztecs went in pilgrimages to Cerro del Huateco, the hill of the Hix... Oh boy, too many, too many weird letters in that word. Histexo. Hixteco. Histeco? Yeah. Those of you all that speak Spanish, I hope you know what I'm trying to say. Those of you that don't speak Spanish, just ignore it. Uh, close to Toxco. To climb to the temple dedicated to the Humil. Now, today in Toxco, the pilgrimage is still celebrated in October on the first Monday after the day of the deceased, when the insects can be served either alive in tacos or cooked and it is the premise of a large festival. The participants gather in the mountain park of Huisteco Humilus and crown the Humil Queen. I guess she would be the stink bug queen. But the habitats of the Humil is menaced due to the farming and housing that is moving into that part of the hill. Would you want to build your house in a location where there are lots of stink bugs? Well, some people might. Are you familiar with the song Down Under by Men at Work? Uh, buying bread from a man in Brussels. He was six feet four and full of muscles. I said, do you speak my language? He just smiled and gave me a Vegemite sandwich. You'll notice I don't sing. Uh, people actually pay me money not to sing. It's that bad. A Vegemite is from Australia, though it is also available in the UK. It's a thick black yeast extract spread. 
Australian Vegemite has added flavors like vegetables and spices, as well as coloring and other additives. It's kind of like what's called Marmite, which you find in England. The people put it on crackers and toast. In Australia, Vegemite is also used as a filling for pastries. A Vegemite was created out of two necessities. One was the fact that World War I disrupted the import of Marmite to Australia. And the other was to find a use for leftover yeast that was being discarded by beer breweries. The creator of Vegemite, Cyril P. Callister, blended the yeast with salt, onion, and celery extract, giving it the vegetable characteristic. <laughs> What does Marmite taste like? They say it tastes like yeast. Uh, salty and strong, sort of like soy sauce paste. It is so strong that the, its own cam uh, marketing campaign says you either love it or you hate it. It's safe to say it's an acquired taste. The most common way to enjoy Vegemite is to spread it on buttered toast. I'm not going to say anything bad about the stuff since I don't have the faintest idea if it tastes good or not. I know what yeast tastes like, but not a huge spread of it. If you give something disgusting an attractive name, it's still disgusting. You can call a fossilized dinosaur poop a coprolite, but it's still poop. <laughs> Cherry blossom meat is horse meat. It's eaten raw, or it's served as sushi. Horse meat can be seasoned with salt and served with soy sauce. In Japan, they eat a lot of things I would never even consider serving to my dogs or cats. But then the folks in Japan might consider eating hot dogs or pizza as being odd. I don't know. I've never been to Japan. Where you're standing on a particular piece of the planet will determine what you think is good or bad. Raw horse meat sounds not only nasty, but dangerous. A cooking does a lot more than make, easy, make meat easy to chew. It kills all the nasty wiggly things that live in uncooked meat. As for sushi, I say nay nay. That is not on my menu as well. A sushi is a Japanese dish consisting of small balls or rolls of vinegar-flavored cooked rice served cold with a garnish of raw fish, vegetables, or egg. I have nothing against the rice or the vegetables. Raw fish sounds like a way of getting some kind of a sea monster living inside your stomach. Raw fish poses several potential hazards for consumers besides parasites. Bacteria can be developed in non-fresh fish and produce enzymes called histamines that may result in scombroid poisoning. A certain tropical fish, uh, tropical water fish, may also have a natural toxin called Sigatora, which causes gastrointestinal and neurological symptoms. I already know the folks who prepare sushi professionally know how to kill all these nasty hitchhikers. How do you know the guy fixing your sushi actually knows what he's doing? Just because he's dressed like a chef doesn't mean he's a chef. It's your body and your health. Do you really like risking having uninvited guests calling your digestive tract home? In the Philippines, they have a dish I will never try. It's called balut. Now, I don't know if the T is silent or not. I've heard it pronounced several different ways. B-A-L-U-T. Balut is an egg that has been fertilized and contains a partially developed embryo. In countries where it is considered a delicacy, a duck egg or a chicken egg may be used to prepare the dish. The mode of preparation is very simple. An egg is boiled and eaten directly from the shell, in much the same manner that boiled and fertilized eggs are eaten around the world. 
In countries where balut is commonly served, the fertilized duck egg or chicken egg is considered to be a superior source of protein. The boiled embryo also considered to add flavor and texture to the egg. Balut may be enjoyed as a quick snack along with beer or some other form of ale or employed as the centerpiece for a meal. You know how when you crack open an egg you get that white runny stuff and the yellow runny stuff in the middle? Well, that's not balut. When you crack open the egg you find a partially formed creature inside. It has bug eyes sticking out, it has a little beak. Some of them even have feathers. Yum. Not. No thanks. I did watch that episode of Destination Truth where Josh and Ryder tried eating these eggs. I believe Ryder got very busy hurling right after the first morsel passed her lips. Yum. I'll let her show me just how much enjoyment I'm missing by not eating balut. Blood soup. A chicken, duck, or pig blood is blood is consumed in places like Shanghai, Poland, Philippines, Korea, and Singapore. The famous Korean blood soup is made with ox blood and is often used as a hangover cure. Right up there with blood pudding and blood sausage. If you eat your blood pudding, do you still have to eat your meat? I'll bet a few of you don't get that one. Back in the army, we had a delicacy known as chipped creamed beef on toast. Some called it SOS, the stuff on a shingle. The stuff was actually, well, it was a different word. I always thought it was too salty and the toast was always soggy within a few seconds. Did I eat it? Yes, I was hungry. I can think of a lot of things I'd rather have for dinner. I remember one time I was given a lump of green jello with onions in it. Lime, jello, and onions. It tasted about as bad as it sounds, but once again I was hungry, so yes, I ate it. I'll bet folks in other countries will be shocked to find out something about Frito pie. You get a bag of Fritos and you drizzle chili in on top of it. Wolf brand chili is best. No beans. A chili should not have beans. Now then you enjoy. I know there isn't anything in there that even kind of sort of looks like pie, but that's what we call it. The oldest known recipe using Fritos brand corn chips with chili was published in Texas in 1949. I eat Frito pie on occasion, but not too often. It's not the most healthy thing out there. Corn smut is a fungus that turns normal corn curls into tumor-like growths covered in blue-black spores. It may look like a disgusting food, something like a diseased corn cob that needs to be thrown out, but many find it to be a delectable delight. In Mexico, it is regarded a culinary specialty. They call it Hitlocoche. Hitlocoche. Sleep? I'm not going to say it. Sleeping excrement. There, I said it. And enjoy the woody, earthy flavor of the fungus. A scrapple lends itself to the old country school of thinking of not letting any part of the animal go to waste. It's a mush made of pork scraps mixed with flour and spices. It's then made into a loaf before getting pan fried. The dish is native to Pennsylvania, especially the Pennsylvania Dutch, who are not Dutch. They're German. Hope someday somebody will figure out that there's no such thing as Pennsylvania Dutch. They're Pennsylvania and German. Well, it looks bad. Now think of a square of gray meat. Once it's fried, it takes on a much nicer looking golden brown texture and it actually looks edible. I would imagine it probably tastes very similar to pork since that is the main ingredient. The Wichiti grub is a larva of the 
Xylitos birpedis, which is a large gray moth of the Cassidia family. These grubs are most often found in the roots of just one plant, the wichiti bush, which is relatively common in central Australia, but they can also be found in the roots of some river red gum. The grubs can be harvested at almost any time of the year, but the colder months usually offer the best time for harvesting, and in an exceptional season up to 50 grubs can be taken from a single tree. The presence of the wichiti grub in the roots of the wichiti bush is usually noted by slight cracks in the soil, indicating the swelling of the roots. The indigenous people of Central Australia take great care to look after the wichiti bush, never digging up more than three of the grubs, oh, correction, three of the bush's shallow roots at any one time. Each root will yield between one or two grubs. The main threat to the continued existence of the wichiti grub is loss of habitat through heavy grazing by in introduced cattle. Very hot summers with wildfires will also kill off these bushes. This food is very important to the indigenous folks of Central Australia, especially women and children, as it is extremely rich in easily assimilated proteins and fats. The wichiti grub is often eaten raw, especially if it's damaged when being removed from the host tree's roots. More usually, the grubs are collected and then lightly roasted on coals for less than a minute, and then eaten. You hold the thing by the head, and you bite just past the neck. The head of the grub is never eaten. When roasted, the taste is reminiscent of egg yolk, popcorn, and almonds. While the wichiti grub is found in other parts of Australia, it is especially important in Central Australia, where there are very few other sources of rich oils and proteins. Over the last 200 years, etomophagi, et, yeah, uh, etomophography among Australian Aborigines has decreased because of the increased adoption of European diets. A changing social structures and changes in demography. Wichiti grubs feature very prominently in indigenous mythology, with many dreamtime stories related to them. If you're going on a walkabout, you don't take provisions. You just walk around out in the brush. When it's time to eat, you look for a quick handy meal, and what is more quick or handy than just pulling a grub from the ground and dinner is served? There were a few dishes I simply skipped, things that I found disgusting, but you all might find horrifying. Let your imagination run wild. Considering the things I just talked about, think about this. There are some foods that even I wasn't willing to talk about. Some people have no morals or scruples. Uh, people become convinced that eating certain things will cure impotence, make their hair grow, make them younger, or all of the above. They are willing to consume things that are illegal, more so than for simple health and hygiene reasons. I wonder about some of those stories I keep hearing about how some of the super-rich Europeans are still alive. You can look it up if you want, but that's all I'm going to say about it here. As far as I'm concerned, Kasu Marzu is number one in the sick and disgusting category. Wormy cheese not only sounds, but it looks nasty, and maggots are not on my menu. If you know of some horrible, disgusting food item, let me know and I'll tell the world that there are things out there that they can eat for dinner that are downright crazy. You can contact me at strangethings at arcanasa.com. All the archives are now available at iHeartRadio on your smartphone or computer. If you want the website, it's not my webpage, but you can find the show at 
www.spreaker.com backslash show backslash strange dash things dash with dash Chris dash James. Man, that is long. It's a lot easier to find on the, uh, the app. Until next Saturday, this is Chris James for Strange Things. Are you, are you coming to the tree with a strong upper man? The same murder three. Strange things that happen here, no stranger would it be if we met at midnight in the hanging tree.